Well, welcome back. <laughs> Glad nobody went anywhere. Um, it is uh, so good again to see all of you on this first night of uh, our spring revival. And uh, we are blessed to have uh, Jerry Chalk with us again this year as our evangelist. And I want to hurry and just get out of his way and give him plenty of time tonight uh, to come and minister to us. And uh, for anybody watching at home, I try to tell Jerry all the time, um, you've got from the end of the steps over there to the end of the steps over here. You can go anywhere you want, but nobody will see you if you leave there. And he always says, no problem. And then about 70% of the video you might see at home, you're going to just hear him because he ain't going to stay in those areas. He's going to walk way over there, way up there. So just to let you know, if you're watching this at home, don't expect to see him for long. Just take a screenshot right now as soon as he gets up and then just save that for later. And then just listen to the rest. Will you welcome our, our evangelist, Jerry Talk? Welcome to the Tak хорошо быть вместе, пробеждение, весна 2022 года. Мы ожидаем Божьего благословения сегодня. Мы знаем, что Он приготовил особенно для нас исцеление, освобождение, пробеждение, что мы можем получать Его силу, откровение во имя Иисуса Христа. Amen. And everyone was like, what in the world he said? Amen. How many greetings in the mighty name of Jesus? It's so good to be with you all. Thank the Lord. To be with you for Spring Revival 2024, oh my goodness. We've been praying, believing, exciting, prophesying, declaring God's blessings and goodness. I believe God has so many things that he has prepared for us. And I believe that we're going to dive into the word together over the next few services. And I believe that God has so many things that he wants to do in our lives. Freedom, healing, deliverance, blessings, and goodness. I have to tell you, I'm just a little excited, and for those of you that know me, that happens often. But tonight it's a little more, more exciting. Um, Danny Chalk will be coming, and he will be greeting. He'll be sharing about student ministry, and we're going to actually do tag team ministry tonight. Translated for y'all. This will be Danny's very first time preaching the Word of God, and it gets to start here. Oh my goodness, how many of So a ministry that's going to cover the earth over the next 50 years, hallelujah, Lord willing, is going to start right here at Three Seas, hallelujah. I can't tell you how excited I am about that. And so as we were believing God to reach students and reach Gen Z and to really believe God that He would pour out His Spirit and lives would be changed. Let me ask you a question. What better way to minister to students than have a student minister to students? Amen. 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 I tell people all the time, Ukrainians can reach Ukrainians better than anybody else. Last month I was in El Salvador. We saw the Lord move mightily, but El Salvadorians can reach El Salvadorians better than anybody. And students can reach students better than anybody else. I'll just say this one thing and let the Lord move through him. The greatest revival, the greatest harvest spell that we have in Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, and even Florida in this nation is these guys. Y'all. Turn to your neighbor now and say, you're awesome. Eighty-five percent of everyone that gets saved in America make a decision before they graduate high school. So if I can get passionate with you just for a second, everything that the old people do, I said it, sorry, everything that the mature people in the Lord do, every single thing that we do can only reach 15% of the population of the United States. You guys are our greatest evangelists. What an exciting time. This is our harvest still. This is, this is where it's at. When people make decisions in our country for Jesus, they do so at a camp, right? Somebody invited them to a Sunday school. Somebody invited them to a BBS. Somebody invited them to a, 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 an outing. Somebody invited them to a retreat. Somebody invited them to something, a club. And that's how they made a decision for Jesus. That's what happened in our generations. That's what happened in the last few generations. 
This is our harvest home. So it's not just student ministry now. It's not just youth night. It's actually our harvest night. So could you welcome Danny Chalk as he shares God's goodness. Well, um, it's good to be in Virginia. Um, yeah, so um, first question that I want to ask y'all is who is ready to get loud? I, I'm sorry, I did not travel like, what, 500 miles driving um, between two different you cities. Drove. Yeah, I drove. I did not drive 500 miles uh, to be quiet up here. Um, so, uh, right again, who's ready to get excited and laugh for the world? Awesome. Like my dad uh, said, my name is Danny Chalk. I'm a uh, freshman in high school. Uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. So, uh, let's, um, uh, let's start. So, uh, with my ministry at Green Hill High School in Mount Juliet um, in Nashville, Tennessee, um, I have a Bible study called uh, Jesus on the Hill. And um, so, backstory uh, with that Bible study, um, back in, what, what is it, 22, I think, yeah, um, at, yeah, 22 at a student conference called uh, Motion in um, Birmingham, Alabama, um, after the Friday night service, I, uh, I had a powerful calling from God um, that said he wanted me to flee the Bible study. I'm like, well, God, like, I've been praying um, that you use me, but I, I'm kind of nervous about this. I'm kind of, um, I mean, I'm an extrovert, but uh, have anxiety over this, and I don't know what people are going to think. And he's like, I want to... Um, I want you to lead a Bible study. And then over prayer um, at that night after service, I'm, I'm listening to God. And he's like um, describing these disciples' stories in the Bible that um, Saul, who became Paul, uh, he was literally murdering, murdering Christians and on the road to actually um, uh, to yeah, to, Matt, to uh, the city of Damascus, he received a calling from the Lord that said, um, you're going to be an evangelist. You're going to reach many people um, because um, his mess became his message and his test became his testimony. And then I was, I was thinking about it and um, Moses, like Friday night, uh, just to clarify, Moses was a stutter. He, um, he actually killed, um, killed one of the masters in Egypt, but God used them to bring the Israelites out of slavery in, uh, in Egypt into the promised land. So as I'm thinking about that, I'm like, well, God, like, that's great and all, but they're like these like figures in the Bible. Like I'm just a, at that time, a 13 year old kid. Um, and he's like, like, I'm going to grow you, um, into becoming, um, hopefully soon a pastor. Um, and I just want to tell y'all that after a year and a half of having a club, um, in middle school and high school, um, it's definitely changed my life and changed many people's lives from the beginning of, um, the beginning of the club. To being just six people coming now being between 10 and 23 people um, at daily every meetings Wednesday. every every Wednesday morning uh, so God is super faithful uh, through that and um, you don't have to be a, a pastor evangelist minister that travels how many 35 nations, 35 nations. goodness gracious um, to to be called by God. You can be, you can be a regular 13, eight, 13 year old um, person or 13 year old kid who's going into eighth grade and still be called by God uh, to reach many people and to grow your relationship and theirs with the most holy father. Um, and 
Um, he's definitely helped me through that. And um, over the past few years, he's showed he, he showed me um, like a like a call to ministry uh, whenever I get older, and definitely helping me through that, uh, turning my message my mess into my message and my tests um, previous previously and now into testimonies to spread the gospel everywhere I go and you can be a part of that. You can start a Bible study in your in your middle school, your high school, or invite a couple people um, in your home. I'm a part of um, something called a scripture squad um, that we read the Bible every Sunday evening and I really dive into the word to uh, to see what God has in store for us and just wanted to um, encourage you guys that you don't have to um, you don't have to go through the training you can be called by God right here right at the spot to do that so um, I have the wonderful privilege uh, to start out um, okay. awesome so this message, get ready, it's time to be loud because your freedom is coming. But in Tennessee, we like to say y'all's freedom is coming. So uh, let's start. If y'all yeah, are taking notes, it, um, we'll be starting in Matthew 20, verse 29 to 34. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind, two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and um, they heard that Jesus was going by. They shouted, Lord, son of, son of David, have mercy on us. But the crowd rebuked him and told him to be quiet. They shouted all the louder, Lord, son of God, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called him, what do you want uh, me to do for you? He asked, Lord, he answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes immediately. Um, and then they received their sight and followed him. So then let's dive into this um, amazing uh, verse here. So I, I was I was thinking about it today, and this is an incredible story that because of their faith, because of um, them hearing about the Lord, they decided we're going to follow Him. And we're going to see what He has in store for us. And, but this kind of relates to to, to us. Because whatever blindness or low self-esteem you're going through today or throughout life, um, and think you have no self-doubt, um, or if you have no um, self-image or no self-worth, look through Jesus and you will find it. That that being said, if if we really seek the Lord, we will find His goodness and his grace to get us through whatever we've been going through or battling. So point, so point one, uh, we're just getting started here. Reach out and touch the Lord as he walks by. And then um, another, another kind of um, image that I was looking, looking at through this verse, they, they weren't born blind. Um, uh, they uh, they were regular folks, um, but they um, uh, they were born blind. But also, we weren't born with depression and stress. So think about it. Maybe something or someone caused caused that for us to go through depression, stress, anxiety, etc. You know, just a food for that. Um, but the blind beggars. Um, these two blind beggars heard Jesus was coming, and they shouted, and they shouted. The question is um, for you to think about, what are you ready to shout for tonight? The Bible tells us two, uh, where two or more are gathered in his name, uh, God is in the midst of them. Same way we are gathered here, Jesus is here tonight, through this revival, um, through through me and my dad coming here from the great state of uh, Tennessee, Nashville, um, to you guys, that Jesus is here tonight. Yeah. And think about it. You don't have to be. You don't have to be in a church setting 
for God to show up. God is always with us. Jesus um, is always in our hearts, but we got to welcome him in our circumstances to receive him. So they understood that their opportunity with God uh, was there. So they met with Jesus and received healing. And then um, my second uh, point through this is there's a difference between the crowd and the seekers. Uh, so to recap, uh, Matthew 20 verse 31, the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. So like I said before, like they, they have faith, even though that the crowd was rebuking them. But in the crowd, the crowd symbolizes the religious, um, the religious group. Everyone wanted um, a touch of Jesus, but the two men were not religious. And they weren't dignified like the other crowd. Like in, in Israel at that time, they, uh, they thought that if you were blind or if you had a disability, um, you were considered dirty. So they weren't dignified or anything like that. But the small faith that they had led them to the healing that was brought. So whenever you step out of the normal crowd um, that uh, might be a religious crowd or um, in school or at work or anything like that, you get hungry for God. Um, me personally, um, through through the Bible study that I lead and through the people that I surround myself with, I got out of the crowd of people pleasers, of um, popular folk, um, and I got rowdy for Jesus because whenever rowdy people, whenever rowdy people are there for God, needs are met. Yes. So um, I, I was thinking about it, and there's. Uh, cool. There's monster chasers, right? There's um, all these different series about um, I'm going to chase this and that and etc. But there's not a series of God chasers, right? So seekers are not man pleasers, they're God chasers. So why don't we make that our reality TV show in our lives and be the God chasers? Of this church and of this state and nation. Amen. Amen. Yeah. God is good. Amen. Yes. Amen. All right. Uh, to also recap Matthew 20, verse 32, Jesus stopped and called him. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. And then the Bible says, Jesus, Jesus the Bible, excuse me, did not say Jesus came to them. It says they came to him. So the blind men. Um, um, the blind man came to Jesus and seeked healing from that faith. So maybe the reason why we are feeling lonely, um, think about this, the reason why we're feeling depression, anxiety, stress, addiction is because we're not seeking God. We're not seeking his presence daily and leading down the path of excuse me, destruction and trouble so every single day we need to seek jesus so that we don't feel lonely we find healing every single day and then first they have faith and then they stop jesus in his tracks and then another question for you all to think about is do you have faith that will stop jesus because jesus was walking with the crowd but then they called out to him and he stopped and then gave them uh, their sight back. And then Jesus called to them. That means that they called out. Um, Jesus called them. That means he called out to them. They were probably standing or stumbling um, with the help of someone else to Jesus because they were blind. But um, uh, as I was thinking about it today, we we all need a prayer warrior, a worship leader, or a pastor. Like we can't make it through throughout life alone. Um, 
because if we're dealing with something, we usually like to vent. I don't know about you guys, but we usually like to vent to somebody, oh, I'm dealing with this or that or this temptation or um, anything like that. But we got to have someone to help us, um, to carry us through everyday life, to find healing from Jesus and keep us accountable and to seek him every single day. Um, so regarding that, I appreciate this wonderful opportunity and I'm going to let God cook, um, for my dad. Um, he, like Pastor Paul said, he's a minister, evangelist, missionary, um, so many other titles and he's an adventure buddy, workout, uh, workout buddy. Um, he's helped me through a bunch of life. Um, he's also forgot to mention, um, uh, my um, my helper in my club to seek God every single day um, and just want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity and I'm going to hand over the mic to you. Thank you. Thank you. Come in. Hallelujah. Alright, that was one of the greatest moments of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So, let me just jump right in, okay? So, it's time to get loud! Sound you loud! Yeah. Oh my goodness! I mean, when they're at a party, I promise they get loud. Woo! Amen! In Virginia, or Virginia Tech, wins the national championship. I promise you're not gonna have a watch party. Oh, really nice. No! Y'all are gonna get rowdy! Amen! If the commanders, if, if, I mean, that, that, that would be a move of the Lord. But the commanders really win the Super Bowl. I mean, seriously. It is not going to be quieter out here. People are going to lose their ever-loving minds. It's like, what do you put your energy into? What do you, where, where's your treasure? Where's your heart? But I just simply, it's time to get loud because your freedom is coming. How many of you are ready for your freedom to come? More people in the chat here. How many of you are ready for your freedom to come? Amen. I'm ready. I'm ready for anxiety to be God. I'm ready for the depression to be God. I'm ready for the low self-esteem to be God. I'm ready for the fear to be God. I'm ready for the shackles to be God. I'm ready to be set free in Jesus' name. Yes. And these guys couldn't see. All they could do is hear. They could hear that people were crying out and calling out to Jesus. And they were so excited. Jesus is coming. This is our chance. This is our opportunity. I believe that they grabbed a couple of guys and said, pick me up and get me over there. And they were stumbling and they were doing everything possible to get to where Jesus is. Now, let me share a, a cool moment that's going to be a recap for some of you. Um, I was even taking notes the last four weeks. Um, I've experienced 16 people in the last 30 years that have received their sight and healing over their eyes. That means I've been a part of either I or a team of pastors have prayed and anointed with oil. People who could not see based on cataracts, based on car wrecks, injuries, sport injuries, or, by, or born that way. I have seen experience 16 people healed from blindness. So this one's near and dear to my heart. Not because just the story, but I've seen it happen so many times. Now, let me share with you the first time I saw it. Is that okay? Because this one really messed me up and really changed my life. And oh my goodness, if you think I'm excited tonight, I was a mess that night. <sighs> Do you know how old I was when I first saw my first person receive their sight? I was 17. So I, I went, I accepted my calling in the ministry at 16, and I went to a mission trip to Ukraine at 17. I didn't, I'm from Oklahoma, bless my heart, right? <laughs> bless my heart. I was geographically challenged, I'm not even kidding. I didn't even know that Ukraine was a country. It was only, it had only been an independent country for three years at the time. But um, I thought, and I know this is very true, I thought I was going to Russia, and I thought Ukraine was a nation in Russia. No kidding. I found out at Chicago O'Hara Airport 
that I was going to Ukraine when the plane said Air Ukraine. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> that's another country. That's wonderful. So long story short, I went to a mission trip to the nation of Ukraine in 1995 when I was 17 years old. And I was the evangelist at a youth camp. And then we did two weeks of ministry. And we actually ministered in Crimea, which is, in, is occupied by the Russian Federation now. So the city where we ministered was Jean Koy. It's an occupied city today. It's a very long story. But as I was ministering there, we, did, we actually had praise and worship. And you know what we did after that? We didn't actually preach the word. We just said that, That's exactly what we said. And I didn't understand what they said either, because I barely spoke English at that time. I was a teenager, hallelujah. I spoke slang in the thick Oklahoma slang. Glory to God. God has a sense of humor. Don't like use anybody, I promise you. And so we just shared that through the blood of Jesus Christ, He can heal you, and God wants to heal you today. Anyone who has a need for healing, come forth. And I mean, half of the, the cultural house or the community center, where we call it community center, they call it cultural house, they came forward for prayer. And I was literally standing right over here, and I, my job as a 17 year old. Ready for this? Help people upstairs. That's all I was doing. I was helping people upstairs. That's all I was doing. And this babushka, which means grandmother, came up and she was just like these guys, just like these two blind men. She was being helped by two ladies. And she came up and she stopped and the ladies beside her were explaining to her that there were steps and she didn't want to walk up the steps because she had lost her sight because of cataracts for the last 10 years. She could not see. So she wanted me to pray for her and I'm like, I'm 17 years old. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not qualified. I'm not ready. Do you want something spiritual, something with a suit and tie on? I've got like this, you know, regular shirt on. Come on now, I'm not ready for this. And I experienced the uh, persistency of a Ukrainian grandmother. Hallelujah. They are some ex ex persistent humans. Amen. Woo! When they want something, I want it. And they're going to get it. I promise you. Hallelujah. So she just grabs my hands. The circulation in my hands stopped. Because she was a strong potato carrier woman. Hallelujah. And she starts praying. And I start praying. And she opens her eyes after the prayer was over. And she says, yeah, he's you. Which means I can see. And I understand what that meant. I looked at my translator beside me. She turns white and she says, She can see. And can I tell you what I said in teenage English? Dude, that's so cool! Oh my goodness! That's exactly my non dignified response to this miracle. I, I was, I've never seen a real miracle in my life. I, Grew up in Oklahoma, bless my heart. You know, I, I just had never experienced the realness of the power of the blood of Jesus. And I was, I got cried more that night than I had in my whole life combined because I was just so blown away with the realness. And this grandmother grabs my cheeks, she grabs my cheeks. And I mean to tell you, I thought they were, I thought my skin was coming off because she just like, ah! she was just kissing me and dancing. and. I mean, she just let loose. It was great. And so she comes up on the stage, grabs the microphone from the, the, the minister and says, the Lord is here. And that little American boy prayed for me and God healed me. It was on. Church, it was on. Which means that amazing grandmother gave one of the best altar calls I've ever heard in my life. We prayed for over three hours for every person in the building. Some people twice. And we saw 17 healings that night. I prayed for a grandfather that I call him, an older man in the Lord. I prayed for a man who couldn't hear out of his left ear for over a decade, and he got killed that night. And I learned something really important as an Oklahoman. If you scream at somebody in a foreign language, that doesn't mean they're going to understand you. If you scream at somebody in a language they don't know, they're going to get scared of you. Hallelujah. And that's exactly what he told my translator. He said, 
please tell the young man that yes, God did heal me. And thank you for praying for me, but ask him not to scream at me anymore. Hallelujah, it was great. <laughs> Learn a lot. It's time to get loud. It's time to receive what God has for us. Because it's real. Because it's available. So tonight, whatever you came in with, whatever you need, whatever you are in asking God for, Jesus has already paid the price for what you're going through. He cares, he loves, and it's real. I know so many times. Is, is it okay to be honest? Is that okay? Is it okay to be honest? We go through the motions. We do all the church stuff. We do all the religious stuff. And so how many times have you come to a church setting, a religious setting, a school setting, a chapel setting, and you come with your problems? And you leave with your problems. Turn to your neighbor and say, not tonight. Not tonight. Not tonight. Not tonight. Tonight's different. Tonight Jesus is here. Tonight God's here. Tonight we're in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Tonight God's ready. Tonight there are a few of you that are hungry. Tonight there are some of you that say, I am ready. I am sick and tired of sitting on the roadside. I'm sick and tired of being blind. I'm sick and tired of being in anxiety. I'm sick and tired of being broken. I'm sick and tired of being hurt. I'm sick and tired of all the horror that's going on in my life. I know Jesus is here. I can hear his voice. I know he's close. And if he's close to me, he's Messiah. He's God. He's healer. And I'm going to scream. And I'm going to get loud. And I don't care what people think. I don't care what people say. I'm going to get obnoxious. Yeah. It's okay to get obnoxious and giving you permission. Hallelujah. It's okay to get rowdy. It's okay to say whatever it takes. I'm not going to live this way anymore. Whew. Number two tonight. Oh, help us, Lord. It's okay to get loud when your freedom is near. It's okay to get loud when your freedom is near. There's a few football fans in the house. Hallelujah. When your team is in the red zone, that's the 20 yard line and closer to the touchdown. That's when you really, really get in a scream, right? That's when you're like pounding. That's when, you, that's when people you don't even know, you're like, let's go. And you're screaming for your team. Have you ever been to a high school football game? And your team is really close to a touchdown? You will lose your voice screaming. For them to just cross the goal line. Why in the world can't we scream when we know that Jesus is about to change our lives? And say, Lord, bring it. Tonight we're actually doing something a little counterculture. We're not asking for Jesus to come to us. These blind men were radical. The Bible doesn't say that Jesus went to them. They had faith that stopped Jesus. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 20, verse 30, 30 and 31, when they heard that Jesus was coming by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. That's the way it translates in Russian and Ukrainian. They had faith that stopped Jesus. That's a little different than just going to church on Sunday. It's a little deeper. How many of you know the crowd is always going to push you down? Four of them. Let me try it again. How many of you in the crowd is going to push you down? 
Have you ever been in a place where people just tore you apart? Oh, my Lord. You had this great idea. You want to start a Bible study. You want to do something wonderful. You want to get together in your house. You want to really step out in faith. And how many times in our lives do we really want to do something and people just beat us down? Man. Man. If we're going to be honest with ourselves tonight, there's so many times in our lives where we, our low self-esteem, our hurt, our pain, is because of the people surrounding us. I got to tell you, the monkey experiment conducted by Harvard University. Very famous. Four monkeys were in an area. They had bananas on the top of what some say was a pole or a ladder. When the monkeys would try to climb up the pole or the ladder, these really not nice scientists or students, probably pre-grad students, hallelujah, <laughs> would pour water on the poor monkeys. Cold water. I mean, come on, it's not really nice. And they would do this continuously until the monkeys no longer wanted to try to get to the bananas. They'd lost hope. No matter what they did, they were going to get cold water thrown on them. They swapped out one new monkey, and they took out one of the old monkeys. Long story short, whenever the new monkey saw the bananas, guess what they did? He <laughs> went to go try to get the bananas. Do you know what the other three monkeys did? They beat the tarnation out of the monkey, tackled him, and was like throwing him around. True story. They were throwing him around because... Or they're trying to stop him from getting to the bananas. It kept on going to where they switched out a second one, and a third one, and a fourth one, to the point where there were four brand new monkeys that had never had water poured on them, but they were still trying to tear each other apart, not to let them go off the pole or the ladder to get to the bananas. Who are you monkeying around with tonight? We call it culture. Right? I agree. Who are who is in your life tearing you down? These two blind beggars were stumbling, hobbling, being drugged, being brought. However, they were coming to Jesus. Jesus didn't go to them. They were trying to make their way by any means possible to where Jesus was. And when they were trying to reach out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the crowd was saying, be quiet. And there's a lot of you tonight. You've had people push you down. You've had people tell you you can't. You've had people tell you that you're not good enough. That you're not pretty enough. That you're not educated enough. And you've had people that have hurt you and have said things about you. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Who do you let in your inner circle? Who's mentoring you? Who's speaking into your life? People will let you down. Tonight, let me ask you a question. Are you trying to please people or please God? You're not trying to get the crowd's attention. You're trying to get Jesus' attention. Can I just make that point just for a moment? Stop trying to please the crowd. Whew. That's a mic drop moment, but I'm not going to break your mic because I really love your pastor in your church. But let me try that again. The two blind beggars were not trying to win a popularity contest with the crowd. I love that. Let that one just sink for a second. Cook, right? I love that word. Just gonna let that cook for a little bit. The two blind beggars did not give a care about what the crowd thought about them. Why are you trying to please people you don't like? Take a couple steps back on that one. Why are you so desperately trying to impress people that you don't even care about? 
We try to buy things we can't afford to try to impress people we don't like and get people that we don't even want to be around us to like us. For some of you, the Lord is trying to say very clearly, get rid of your monkeys! Hallelujah! Can you become a God pleaser in place of a crowd pleaser? Let me try it in a different way. When people try to tell you no, and people try to tell you you can't, Will you yell louder? <laughs> this one's a default for me. <laughs> I just really get excited when people tell me I can't do it. It's like, I just get my engine revving. Hallelujah. It was just in the nation of El Salvador, what, last month? Yeah, March, wow. Whew. In six days, we saw 109 people receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I want to try that one more time. In six days, we saw 109 people receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Praise God. Amen. Amen. We were able to be a part of two church plants. And I will very quickly tell you about Alegria. Alegria is a mountaintop um, not too far um, from San Salvador, the capital. It is a very small village, about 50,000 people. They grow some of the best coffee, hallelujah, on the planet there. And we planted a church in Alegria three years ago. I think I was sharing with this local church about it. And a long story short, we planted the church, which is the people. And we were in a project where we were raising funds, and you all were a part of it, thank you. We were able to send out $5,000 for the materials. The people there provided the labor, and over the last three years, they've been building a building, which is the Casa de Dios or the House of the Lord or the House of Prayer. Guess what got to happen last month in March? We got to have service, the people, in the Casa de Dios building for the people. So we got to plant the church, and we got to have church in the building. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. Somebody give God the praise, man. <laughs> We've been a part now of 14 church plants over the last few years in the nation of El Salvador. But God's doing mighty things. And some of the most amazing stories is uh, Pastor Jose was an amazing pastor. I ministered at his church and did many outreaches with him, but he was a drug addict. Try that one more time. Pastor Jose was a drug addict. He was somebody that me and you probably wouldn't associate with, and a lot of people in the church didn't associate with. He was also homeless. But somebody from the church of the Lord went and ministered to Jose. First, they fed him. Second, they brought him into the custom of the U.S. They brought him into the house of the Lord and let him live for four weeks. Guess what happened to Jose? He got Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He got set free. He got healed. Some wonderful, some wonderful grandmother went and prayed for him and cast out demons. And, I mean, for over four hours, she prayed Jesus all over him, shook him and he went silly, hallelujah, until God moved on his life and he was set free. Amen. Praying grandma, love you, praying, praying grandma, hallelujah. 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 Now he's a pastor. Nice. Now he's an evangelist. Amen. He goes into places that I can't go as an American in El Salvador. When people tell him no, he grabs a mission team and he goes. He's been a part of seven church plants. How many of you are ready to get loud? Four of you, let me try it again. How many of you are ready to get loud? Oh yeah. Ready for God to move. Ready for God to show his glory. Ready for God to change your life. 
Ready for God to change your home? Ready for God to change your destiny? I mean, honestly, what is it that you need from the Lord? What is it you're carrying? Are you ready to develop a whatever it takes mentality? A whatever it takes mentality sounds like this. I'm going to be ready to break up the roof of a building just to lower somebody down to Jesus. Yeah, that happened. Imagine a building, a small building, but a building so full of people that they went and they couldn't get in because the religious wouldn't let people in. The church folk, hallelujah, wouldn't let people in. So they, they got their friend, they tore off the roof, and they lowered him down. This is next level church. Yeah. We'd have to look into our homeowners insurance, but hallelujah. They tore off the roof, and they lowered the guy down to receive healing. That's what I'm talking about. The woman with the issue of blood. She threw elbows. She wasn't nice. But for many years and over a decade, she had blood hemorrhaging, or what we call an issue of blood. And when she knew that Jesus was close, you know what she did? She literally got on all four. Shut up, my kind. She went four-wheel drive. She went four-wheel drive. Kicking, throwing elbows with a bunch of men and a bunch of selfish religious people all around her. And she didn't care about them. And she didn't care what it took. She said, I'm going to get to where Jesus was. And she didn't even touch his body. She just touched the hem of his garment. She just got that close. And when you get that close to Jesus with that kind of faith, you know what it does? It does exactly what the blind beggars. It stops Jesus in his tracks. Because faith touches the heart of our Savior. Faith changes things. Faith moves mountains. Faith gets God's attention. And that's when miracles happen. Hallelujah. It's when blind and crazy grandmas get healed. And because I have faith, but she was been praying for so long. And she knew. We were the first missionary team that she'd ever experienced in her life. And she was a believer from her birth. And she was a believer through atheism and through communism. We were the first mission team that she'd ever heard. And she had faith. And God healed her. Do you have break up the roof mentality? Do you have the issue of blood mentality? My next one's one of my favorites. You have the climb the tree mentality. <laughs> oh my goodness. Look at him. He was a little guy. And he was so short. This is all for the short people. Hallelujah. He was so short. And he couldn't see. Do you know what he did? Problem solving. Hallelujah. Climb the tree just to get to where Jesus was. By him climbing a tree, his faith and his desire to experience Jesus was so great. You know what Jesus said? Come on down, I'm coming to your house. And you're cooking dinner, let's go. Oh my goodness. Faith, it gets the attention of the Lord. When people were willing to act on their faith, that's when something happens. Number three tonight. And I'm going to have whoever's going to be playing the keyboard to go ahead and come up or the worship team. Go ahead and come up tonight. And number three, faith that gets Jesus' attention and will move the hand of God. Matthew chapter 20, verse 32 to 34, it says there, Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Verse 33. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Verse 34. This is the part that I get really excited about because it's in your Bible. Verse 34. Jesus had compassion on them. 
Jesus had compassion on them. Let's go through the precepts. Let's go through the concepts of what we're trying to explain tonight. They had faith. They heard that Jesus was near. They picked themselves up some way, somehow. They probably got a few people to help them hobbling, stumbling along. And their faith was so great. They shouted to Jesus. The religious people told them to be quiet. You know, they did not shout it even more. They got loud. They got right until they got Jesus' attention. And as they got Jesus' attention, he asked them a question. What do you want me to do for you? And that's a question tonight for you. What did you come tonight for? Why are you here? What do you need Jesus to do for you? Every need here tonight has already been priced, has already been paid. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. That means he was stripped. He was naked. They were destroying his character. They were doing all kinds of horrible things. They were taking his robe and they literally were bowing before him and mocking him. They were literally throwing dice to see who could get his robe. They were destroying him. They were scourging him. They were making fun of him. People were throwing things at him. Why? So that in Christ's name, Virginia, tonight, anyone that is here with an anxiety issue, you are free in Jesus' name. Because there's 10 of you that are battling depression, and there's many of you that are battling clinical depression in the house of the Lord tonight. You're here, and we love you. And some of you go to this church, and some of you go to other churches, but you're battling an inner battle, and you don't want anybody to know about your problems. You don't want anybody to know that you're human. You don't want anybody to know that some of you are dealing with suicidal thoughts. Some of you are dealing with, dealing with low self-esteem. But he specifically was chastised for your mental peace, your emotional peace, your spiritual peace, and your physical peace. The price, according to the word, has been paid. You can receive freedom. You can receive healing. There are some of you that are here tonight and you're working through and you're going through a broken heart. How many of you ever been lied to? How many of you ever been lied about? We've gone through so many things. And in those things, he's never left you, he's never forsaken you. Are you ready to have faith that will stop Jesus in his tracks? One thing that I was doing a deep dive and researching in this story is the Bible doesn't say that the crowd, all of the crowd got their needs met. The Bible doesn't say that everyone in the crowd that Jesus literally healed everyone. When Jesus fed the 5,000 or the 13,000 people, Everyone got fed, but in this story, it doesn't say that the crowd all got healed and all got their needs met. But there were two. There were two. There were two people. They got their needs met. 
What separated the two blind beggars from the crowd? They were willing to do whatever it took. They had faith to stop Jesus. When everyone told them to be quiet, <laughs> they got louder. I just love these guys. Jesus was stopped by their faith. Religion and going through the motions is not going to bring your breakthrough. So many people are expecting Jesus to come to them. These bold men were following, stumbling to get to where Jesus is. I don't know who this is for, but God put this in my spirit to deliver tonight. I want you to receive it. Tonight, the label is coming off. People have labeled you. People have established who you are. They've established your reputation. Even the Bible 2,000 years ago, when you read in your Bible, it says the two blind men are the two blind beggars. Spoiler alert, they're not blind anymore! Tonight, Jesus wants to do a work in your life so that you don't live in your dysfunction anymore. You're no longer going to be known as the partier. You're no longer going to be known as the class clown. You're no longer going to be known as the drug addict. You're no longer going to be known as the person with the addictions. You're no longer going to be known as the drama king or the drama queen. Tonight the label comes off. Because when Jesus doesn't work in you, you're not blind anymore. You're not anxious anymore. You're not depressed anymore. You're not hurting anymore. You're healed. You're restored. What are you known for? When people talk about you and they do, what do they say? So guess what? In church history, when we begin to do a deep dive into their lives, they're not known in the first 300 years of Christian history as the two blind beggars. They're known as bold, healed evangelists. These two guys go on, as the Bible says here, they go on to be followers of Jesus. They personally encountered Jesus. They personally were healed by Jesus. And they went and they followed him. And for the rest of their lives, they were evangelists. They told people of Jesus, I once was blind, but now I see I have had a God encounter. I have met the King of Kings. I have met the Lord of Lords. He did a work in me, and He can do it in you. You can receive Jesus. You can receive His power. You can receive His glory. You can receive His anointing. There's a difference between a religious service and a God encounter. But if you really ever encounter God, if you ever meet Him, He'll change your life. You know what you're going to do? For the rest of your life, you're going to tell people, I met Jesus. So at 16, I met Jesus. And my God encounter was so life changing. I was at church camp like so many people are. I was prayed for by a Cajun. Louisiana evangelists that didn't know any better. Hallelujah. Those guys are wild. Oh my goodness, they're a different breed. But he prayed for me. 
And I was slain in the spirit for over two hours. And I had a God encounter, real God encounter. And when I came out of that, I've never been the same since. Because I met Jesus. And he healed me. And he saved me. And he really redeemed me. And he changed my life. And you know what I've gotten to do for the last 30 years this year? I've been in the ministry 30 years this year. It's insane so fast. But for 30 years, I've been able to travel this nation and 35 nations of the world. You know what I get to do? Same thing that two blind beggars did. I met Jesus. He healed me. He redeemed me. He changed my life. And if he did it for me, he can do it for you. What do you need from my Savior? Tonight we're not fine. Okay. 